Hi, this is Tina Lam. Welcome to the AS in the Air online activity. This May, we will host a series of special talks about modular self-reconfigurable robots to help promote knowledge sharing and technological advancement in this field. Today is the third week in this series. Again, we will have two scholars in this field to share their wisdom with us. There will be a Q&A session after each talk. You are welcome to interact with our speaker by typing your question in the chat box or asking questions directly with your microphone if you are using Zoom. All right, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Michael Robinstein. Uh, professor Michael Robinstein is currently an assistant professor at Northwest University. He received his PhD degree from the University of Southern California in computer science. He was a po postdoctoral researcher in the Self-Organizing System Research Group at Harvard University. His research interest, uh, interest is to advance the control and design of multi-robot system, enable their use instead of traditional single robots, and to solve problems for which traditional robots cannot suitable, are not suitable. He works on famous swarm robotic system, Kitobots, a robot designed for testing swarm algorithm and in a group of, of over a thousand robots. And the Kitobot research has also earned a spot as one of the top 10 scientific breakthrough achievement of the year by the editors of Science Magazine. And he is an associate editor of the IEEE Transitions of Robotics. The topics he's going to share with us today is Fry and 3D. 3D Lonetic Modular Cell with Configurable Robot. All right, let's welcome Professor Michael Robinstein. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm Mike Rubenstein. I'm faculty at Northwestern University in the Center for Robotics and Biosystems. And today I'm going to talk about a modular robot called FireAnt uh, that works in a non lattice uh, setting. So this work is work done by, uh, in collaboration with a PhD student in my lab, Petra Swissler. Uh, so everything that you're seeing here is work that he's done as well. Um, so I want to kind of briefly describe why I think modular robots are interesting uh, with an uh, example of a collective behavior found in nature. So this is a picture of an army ant nest called a bivouac. Um, and what you see here is, a, is like a normal ant, normal ant nest where there's tunnels and chambers, just like those normal ant nests. Uh, but this is made only out of the interconnected bodies of over uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of ants. Um, so it's very interesting that ants can work together to form these structures just by connecting to each other. Um, so this structure has many advantages. Uh, it, you know, it's self-assembled, so it can be made out of these small individual agents. Uh, it can be repaired. If there's damage, they can remove, uh, they can adjust their shape in order to repair that damage. Um, they can do lots of small bivouacs in parallel. So these temporary bivouacs for storing food. And this is also scalable in the sense that if you added or removed ants, it would adjust the size of the bivouac automatically. So this is kind of an inspirational uh, example found in nature. Uh, I want to describe an example of what this would look like in an engineered system. So uh, looking at the setting of the Mars rover, uh, it's a, you know, a very advanced robot that was designed for traveling on terrain on Mars. Um, and it came across some terrain that it had a trouble walking or driving across because it was very soft sand and actually got stuck there for many months. Uh, so what would happen if instead of sending a traditional rover like the Mars rover, we sent something that was composed of many individual modules that can adjust how they attach to each other? Well, if it gets stuck in sand, you can just change your shape into like a snake, which is very good at tra traveling across soft sand to get stuck out of this uh, soft sand. Uh, Furthermore, if like there's damage to the leg, like shown here with this red area, you can drop off the broken modules and just move extra modules to repair the damaged area. Uh, you can even split into multiple robots to accomplish tasks in parallel, uh, each one acting as an independent agent where they're uh, composed of these individual modules. Uh, so that's kind of the promise of what modular self reconfigurable robots can do. Um, I'm just going to show a few examples of kind of what has been done so far. Uh, you can kind of categorize these robots into three categories. So one are robots that exist in a lattice. Uh, so like these robots uh, from MIT called M-Blocks can only attach to their neighbors in uh, one of nine positions uh, and they maintain a, a, you know, a, a square lattice. Uh, there are robots that are uh, chain-based where they can attach to each other but also 
adjust their orientation to their neighbors relative to each other by adjusting their motors. Um, and there's also some hybrid versions where sometimes they behave like a, mod uh, a lattice robot uh, for re mostly for reconfiguration. And sometimes they behave as a chain-based robot for locomotion or faster reconfiguration. Um, but if you compare what you see in these robotic systems with what uh, is being done for uh, biological systems, there are some differences that uh, are pretty apparent. So um, when you look at some self-assemblies in especially uh, insects, uh, you can see that they kind of create these irregular non-lattice structures. Uh, both these ants as well as these bees aren't in a particular lattice. Where if you look at what is being done generally in reconfigurable robots, they often sit in these ordered lattice structures. Uh, this is partially because of the constraints to the docks, but also sometimes it makes it easier to reason about how reconfiguration works. Um, so some problems with creating a system out of lattice, uh, a lattice-based robot is uh, you can have issues related to tolerance stack and uh, warping due to gravitational load. So for example, here, uh, if there's a bunch of modules in a lattice and you want to connect from one side of the lattice to the other, if there's any warping in the lattice, they can't make that connection because the robots must be in these lattice configurations. Also, if you start from different, or uh, different origins, so say you're trying to build a bridge from one side of the river and another bridge from the other side, you meet in the middle. If you don't perfectly uh, match where these bridges start, there may be a uh, an issue with attaching the lattices. Um, so that's one advantage to having a non-lattice structure. It makes it relatively easy to build, uh, to counteract uh, imprecision due to tolerance and also having uh, starting from multiple origins. Um, a lot of the uh, characteristics of these modular robots are uh, found or based on how they attach to each other. So uh, just generally looking at three different categories of how modular robots attach to each other. Uh, one is this mechanical rigid attachment like Atron, where you have hooks that physically attach robots together. Uh, this has the advantage of being very strong, but also mechanically complex and often heavy and hard to make. Um, another type could be <coughs> electrically activated, where uh, either there's a, a magnet that you turn on and off, or you melt some solder that attaches the, the faces of the robots together. Uh, this has the advantage of being relatively simple, but still has uh, a lattice configuration that they're trying to enforce. There's also robots that use passive attachment methods. So either they're attaching with magnets or they're using Velcro to attach each other. Um, the advantage of this is it's relatively easy to make those atta attachments because they have self-orienting features. Uh, but the disadvantage is that you, if you want to reconfigure, you need to break those atta attachments with your own motors, and uh, that limits the strength of the attachments as part of that structure. Uh, so I want to look at how do you build an attachment method that has the, the all the advantages of these systems with hopefully a few of the disadvantages. So something that's very strong, uh, that's easy to control, and allows you to attach anywhere on your neighbor surfaces. Um, so that's kind of inspired from nature. If you look at how army how ants attach to each other, they're not attaching in particular lattices. They're grabbing onto each other with their arms in any position and orientation. Sometimes they're biting onto each other. So there's a lot of diversity in how they attach to each other, and maybe you want to build a robotic system that can do the same thing. Um, so this idea of robots that are atta attaching each other outside a lattice uh, has been done a few times before. Uh, so one of the first ones that I was able to find is this slime bot, which uh, uses uh, gender uh, genderless Velcro, so these black strips on the bottom, to have modules attached to each other. Uh, so these can attach without particular alignment. So uh, the advantage is it's easy to attach to each other, but this advantage is these are often weak attachments, and this is a 2D, uh, you know, a system that exists on 2D ground. Um, the S10 Robotica is another example of non lattice robots uh, where they have little screws that screw into this fabric covering of the robots. Uh, they can attach anywhere that the robot's covered in fabric, uh, but they still need to orient the gripper so that way it can face the fabric uh, correctly. Uh, and these are also limited to, uh, to the operation. Uh, and then uh, the Freebot, which I think will be talked about next, uh, is an example of uh, something that uses magnets to attach to each other. Uh, so you have to, uh, the attachments are relatively weak compared to some of the other attachment mechanisms because you have to be able to break those attachments. Um, and there's also also disadvantage that sometimes it's only possible to have one magnet per robot. Uh, so I wanted to kind of draw from this uh, 
these examples of non lattice robots to build a robot that uh, can attach anywhere on their neighboring structures, but also attach in a strong way. So I'm going to talk about uh, Fire Ant 2D, which is the robot on the left, and then the advancement of that, which is Fire Ant 3D. And then if there's time, I'll talk about some algorithms we can run on these robots. So here's a video of uh, the capabilities of Fire Ant 2D. What you're looking at is a tilted plane. So this is something that's tilted about 50 degrees. Uh, and the robot is able to move along the structure. So these uh, six circles are, uh, mod uh, are inactive modules of the same shape, and it's able to move along those inactive modules. So I'm going to talk about how this robot actually does this type of locomotion. Um, so the key with Fire Ant 2D is that it has this uh, idea of continuous docks, which means that it can attach to its neighbors in any position that it can, uh, that can touch the neighbors. Uh, so anytime it can touch the neighbors, it can also attach it. It doesn't need to worry about being attached in a precise lattice location or discrete location. Um, also, these robots are entirely covered in docks. Uh, so anywhere another robot can touch that robot, it also has a dock there. So uh, you don't have to reason too much about how you actually uh, come in contact with your neighbors, because no matter how you come in contact with the neighbors, you can attach them directly. So let's look at how this actually works. Uh, and the main idea is that the robots use these wheels that are covered in conductive plastic rims uh, in order to attach to each other. If you look at the details of these rims, uh, this is a cross section of the rim. There is this black conductive plastic, and inside that conductive plastic is a uh, copper wire embedded in it. Um, and attached to that copper wire is this brush plate. So electricity can flow through the brush, through this plate, through the copper core, and into the conductive plastic rims. So putting that together, here's two robots that are two sphere or circles that are energized with uh, 24 volts. Current flows through the cop the copper into the point of contact, and at that point of contact, it passes through the conductive plastic, melting it, causing these two circles or two wheels to to fuse together. Once you let it cool, it forms a strong rigid connection. And you can reverse this by applying power to it again, remelting it, and pulling them apart. So the idea here is that we can uh, effectively weld these robots together using electrical contact. OK, so if we want the robots to attach to each other, we need to somehow sense that they're able to, uh, that they're attaching in order to control the robots. Uh, so the two things we care about checking for are the contact area between the two uh, wheels, and also how hot does the dock get in order to make sure that we get hot enough so that we can melt the dock. Um, to measure indirectly measure the contact error, we just look at the amount of current that's flowing through the two wheels, and the more current that's flowing through uh, is a proxy for how much uh, for the, a larger area of contact. And to uh, measure the temp or to approximate the temperature of the docks, we just look at the time integral of the current, assuming that it's heating up quickly enough. Uh, this is a good proxy of how hot the docks are. Uh, so if we want a sense of a dock is attaching to a neighbor correctly, all we need to do is actually just use a current sensor, and it can sense contact as well as a successful docking or not. So to measure the capabilities of these docks, uh, we created this uh, test rig, which has a linear actuator, which can attach the docks together. Using a load cell, it can try pulling them apart and measuring how strong the attachment is, and it can do this in a repeated manner. So here's a video of that testing in action. Uh, you can see that the docks are pushed together, they're heated, they test that they can hold five kilograms, they undock the robots and repeat. So this is a test rig that showed that we can actually do this 200 times in a row and not actually have any failures on the docking. So it's a relatively uh, robust docking mechanism. Um, the, the, uh, the way that we actually did the testing is that showed here in this uh, diagram. Uh, we also were able to show that these uh, modules are relatively strong. So if you put these two modules together and you pull till breaking force, on average, it takes 20 kilograms of force to break those two uh, docks apart. OK, so that is the continuous dock. Let's talk about the entire robot as a whole. So there's three sections of the robot. This blue area right here are two continuous docks attached to the robot. Uh, the green area are motors that can spin the continuous docks at a, a relative to the uh, gray chassis here. And there's also electronics on board here as well. And to power the whole system uh, out of plane of where the plane of the module docks uh, are is this power bus. Uh, so this allows the uh, robot to get power whenever these two contacts are touched. So 
these this power bus is two rails. One is uh, ground and one is 24 volts, which powers the entire robot. OK, so looking at some of the details of the robot, uh, the robot is powered by an Arduino. Uh, it has two motors, which are controlled by an Arduino and an H-bridge, as well as two H-bridges that can power electrically power the dock by turning the voltage on and off and handling the current required. Uh, and the other uh, question is, how do you build a robot that can move anywhere in a 3D system, as opposed to just a robot that's moving along a 2D plane? So this is uh, FireAnt 3D. Uh, it's covered in the same type of dock as before, so it's using a continuous dock, and it has the ability to move over uh, like neighbors, uh, just using the same type of locomotion. Okay, so the docks are a little bit different from the 2D fire ant. So the way the docks are made is that they're a, a they have a layer of conductive plastic. So the outer layer is this black conductive plastic. Uh, inside that is a copper mesh. Below that is another conductive plastic layer, and then below that is an insula insulating layer. So we have a sphere that's made up of a material that is wrapped uh, in this way. And the other addition is that we have this ground hoop. So the way current flows through the docks is through this copper mesh, through the point of contact, and then back to this ground hoop to return the circuit. So here's an example of that in action. The two robots come in contact. The ground hoop drops down. Uh, it applies power, melting the point of contact. Uh, once that is cooled down, it forms a strong, rigid connection. And then you can just reverse this by applying power again and then pulling the, the, the robots apart. Um, so we tested the strength of this new uh, three-dimensional dock. Uh, and if we attach it to three spheres like this, it took over uh, 750 newtons to pull them apart. And this is pretty impressive considering that the robot itself only weighs two pounds, about a kilogram. Um, we also measured the lifetime of these docks. So we repeatedly attached at the same point 50 times without any failure. Uh, and this point actually only takes up about 1.5% of the dock surface area. So if we were randomly attaching the dock, we'd have a very long, uh, long and significant lifetime of the individual docks. If they ever become uh, uh, too damaged, we can just take a soldering iron and smooth these docks down again if we need to. OK, so briefly looking at the mechanical design of FireNet 3D, uh, there's two main components. These One component is these three spheres. Uh, and then these three spheres are attached to the center body, uh, which holds them together. So looking at these three spheres, which are basically identical to each other, there are two actuators on board the, the spheres. So one is an actuator that allows the purple to rotate relative to the docking surface, the purple arm here. The other one is allows the uh, ground hoop return hoop to move relative to the purple surface. And there's also this attachment mechanism that pushes the, the sphere into the center body, which has a passive degree of freedom as well. Looking at the center body, uh, the arm of the sphere goes into one of these three bearing connections and allows it to rotate passively along that bearing. And there's also force sensors, which allow us to measure how much force is being applied relative from the sphere relative to the center body. Uh, each center body is relatively identical in terms of electrical design. Uh, they have Each one has an onboard battery and a logic controller. Uh, these batteries are wired in series through the center body to give us 36 volts allowing us enough power to, to melt the uh, points of contact. Uh, the sphere itself is relatively simple, uh, similar to the 2D fire ant, has an H-bridge for melting uh, the, the, the uh, conductive plastic and has, also has motors for moving the motor, robot around. OK, so the way the robot works is very similar to 2D, but on a 3D system. Uh, Imagine you have a robot that's attached to uh, a base of spheres with robot A attached to one sphere and robot B attached to another sphere, and we want to move in the direction to the right. Well, we first use the hoop to melt uh, sphere B. And when sphere B is melted, we can pull it off the surface, detaching sphere B from the surface below. We then start to apply power to the motor on sphere A, which can lift the whole robot up. Uh, and uh, we reposition the uh, ground hoop returns, uh, ground return hoops. And then we continue moving motor A until uh, the spheres come in contact with the ground below. So you can see that first sphere C comes in contact. And then due to that passive degree of freedom, the robot can rotate and continue pressing sphere B down onto the surface below. And then we choose which sphere we want to attach to. And then we 
bring the hoop down and attach to the sphere C and continue this. So by choosing which spheres we attach to, we can change our direction by 60 degrees. I'm oh, sorry, by 120 degrees. Here's an example of Fire 3D in action. Uh, first, uh, it's moving along a surface on the, on the ground. This wire here is just for remote control. There's no power being sent to the robot. Uh, taking the same type of behavior, you can actually have the robot crawl up a vertical surface. So here it is uh, using the same behavior just to crawl up a vertical surface. And the behavior is really agnostic to the direction it's moving. So here it is crawling on the bottom of a ceiling. So it's upside down crawling along the bottom of the ceiling. Okay, um, so that was FireNet 3D. Uh, and I just wanna briefly mention that we're in process of finishing off FireNet 3D version two. Uh, so with some improvements, what we did is we uh, reduced the size significantly, reduced the weight significantly, and also the number of motors. So we went from six motors to two motors, oh, sorry, three motors. Uh, so it's a much lighter, uh, simpler robot. And it's also uh, more robust uh, attachment mechanisms. Here's an example of Fire 3D version two in action. Uh, here, we're just moving along a surface that's made of conductive plastic. Now, this is still kind of a work in progress. So it's uh, not a final video yet, but just showing kind of where we're going from here. This robot is uh, significantly smaller than the original robot, which makes it uh, relatively stronger uh, to attach to the surface. Okay, so I want to talk. I want to spend the remaining few minutes talking about an algorithm that we developed for running uh, self-assembly on this FireNet 3D. Um, and this algorithm is inspired from self-assembly that we see in social insects. Uh, so looking at how uh, insects can form cantilevers and towers and chains, uh, you know, using these type of non-lattice connections between them without any explicit blueprint that controls the shape that they're forming. So this looks relatively different compared to how robotic self-assembly works in modular self-reconfigurable robots uh, currently. Uh, generally, these robots are following a blueprint to form a particular shape, and they are using uh, frequently using lattice uh, connections to simplify the reconfiguration. Um, but if we can do this with a non-latticed uh, structure, then maybe we can help uh, deal with some of these problems with uh, uh, lattice robots. Okay, so also another thing that's interesting about way self-assembly is done in nature is that it's often without blueprints, whereas if you look at how robotic systems form shapes, that's often following a particular blueprint. Uh, there's just a few examples of robotic systems that form structures without actually having a blueprint built in mind. Uh, so looking at these a little bit, uh, one is building these cantilevers, uh, which uh, has these individual robots stay in a 2D lattice. Uh, so it's constrained into a 2D lattice, uh, but it is reacting to local forces and determine how to build that structure. Another one is by Melinda Malley, uh, a set in robotic uh, simulation where uh, they have these robots that are flipping through the uh, environment and they kind of build these bridge structures, build structures uh, that look like bridges that let them kind of shortcut the whole path that they have to take. Um, and what we're going to talk about in this work is looking at a robot that uh, builds these amorphous non-lattice structures in a 3D environment and also can build things like uh, a wide range of, of structures like chains, towers, cantilevers, and bridges. So the requirements that we have for this system is very similar to what FireNet 3D is capable of. So in some sense, we're simulating the abilities of FireNet 3D. Basically, we expect the robots to be able to climb over versions of themselves in the environment, send local messages to their neighbors, and sense the direction to some goal position. Um, the robots in this algorithm take on two roles. First, they start as a moving robot. And then once they reach a position they want to join the structure, they permanently become part of the structure and stay that stay a part of the structure from there on out. So I'll show an example of what this algorithm looks like, a very simple example. Uh, say you have some goal position right here and an initial group of robots. What the robot does is it starts moving towards the goal. So it looks at which dock is closest to the goal and flips over that dock. Uh, and once it's ready to move again, it again does this behavior and continues to flip over the dock that's closest to the goal until it reaches the point where the dock it just flipped over is still the one that's closest to the goal. So it's reached some type of local maxima or local minima and uh, it stops and joins the structure there. 
another another behavior is using communication to recruit robots to join the structure. So imagine that there's a robot here that detects a high force uh, on its body. So it's being pulled or pushed in a way that creates a high uh, high strain on its st stress uh, on its sensors. Um, it actually sends out a message, which is trying to recruit other robots to join the structure near it. So say it sends out a message with a value of three. Uh, and every time a robot receives that message, it takes that value, decrements it by one and propagates it further. So you can kind of create this gradient of, of uh, recruitment. And if a robot's moving along the structure, say this robot starts moving along the structure and it reaches a point where it's touching a robot that has a recruitment value, it then also joins the structure as well. So in some sense, uh, by joining the structure, we're hoping that it can actually reduce the stresses on the original robot that was detecting these stresses and uh, reduce the recruitment gradient as well. Okay, so a little bit more detail about how the algorithm works is that if there's uh, any, uh, if the, uh, the sense force is less than some threshold, they don't recruit any neighbors. Uh, otherwise, they recruit neighbors proportional to the amount of stress that they receive. So the more stress they receive, the higher the recruitment value is. Um, and then we max out the recruitment value to be some maximum value. Whenever a robot is determining whether what its recruitment value is, it looks at uh, its own value and the value of its neighbors and determines which one is larger and uses that as this recruitment value. Uh, we, we created a simulation in MATLAB uh, that allows us to uh, test this behavior uh, in, a, in a relatively quick way. Uh, and we're using a uh, a finite element model to test the stresses that are on the structure as it's being built and have the robots measure the stress on their sensors. Um, so I'll skip to an algorithm, an example. So here we have a light source up on the top of the environment and the robots are starting one at a time, joining the structure and moving until either they've been recruited to join the structure or they reach the point where they're closest to the light source. The colors here represent, I'll go back one slide. The colors here represent the stresses on the robots. So you can see eventually we'll, receive, we'll see a robot with high stress and that will recruit robots to join the structure to reduce the stress on that robot. And just using the simple behavior, we're able to get robots that build this tower towards a light source. An interesting property of this behavior is also that we can have, we have some control over the total stresses or the maximum stress in the structure based on that threshold force. Uh, so by adjusting the threshold force, we can actually adjust the total, uh, the, the final peak stresses on the entire structure as a whole. Um, so if we want to have a taller, uh, if we have a higher threshold force, we can actually create taller towers because they don't have to re reinforce themselves as much. Using the same behavior, but now we placed a light source below the structure and the robots are moving downward towards the light source. We're forming this hanging chain here. And you can see that robots are, again, able to uh, reinforce the structure by being recruited when there's a robot that has a high stress. Again, we're able to control the, uh, the peak stresses in the structure just by adjusting the threshold force value. Um, we, can, we can also build cantilevers with the same behavior. So here's an example of a cantilever being built uh, where there's a, the light source is off to the right here and it's recruiting robots to move toward the light source while reinforcing uh, the cantilever as being built. Uh, we get uh, cantilevers that look like this where uh, they start to build out, but there's also a support structure that keeps them from breaking. Uh, taking the same type of behavior, but now having two light sources where we're taking turns moving robots from left to right, we want to, uh, in some sense, build a bridge uh, across this gap. And now you can see that they were able to build this bridge that allows robots to move from one side to the other. Okay, um, so briefly, uh, you know, just some highlights of reactive build here is that uh, we're able to build uh, structures uh, that have a high degree of autonomy uh, on individual agents. Uh, we're able to build these multi-origin structures like building a bridge from the right to the left. And we're able to control the uh, total force found in the structure by just this simple, simple parameter of threshold force. Um, and some takeaway is that uh, you know this behavior and these robots are operating outside of a lattice. Uh, and sometimes it may be actually easier to do this uh, because you don't have to worry about the connection between individual modules. And you don't have to worry about having these, these errors that occur when you're building st structures out of lattices. Um, so I think that's all the time I have. Uh, so 
I wanted to thank uh, NSF for funding this. And this is also a project that is being done by my PhD student, Petra Swissler. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Michael Robinson. Uh, it is a very inspiring talk and uh, it amazed me a lot. Uh, so uh, we can take some questions uh, in the following sessions. Is there any questions from the audience? Um, maybe I uh, I take this uh, chance to ask a question first. Yeah, sure. but I saw that uh, your uh, local motion is using just like a, a flow motion, just like ants uh, climbing to another uh, uh, robot to make the uh, local motion of the robot, which is uh, much different from uh, other modular self configurable robot. Uh, for other uh, self configurable robot, they uh, make the uh, to form a shape and then use the joint motion for local motion instead of uh, uh, reconfiguration uh, continuously. So mm -hmm. um, my question is, uh, it is also possible for fry and 3D to uh, do the local motion uh, with the joint motion, and which one is much better in your opinion? Um, yeah, so if you know, you can imagine you have a structure like this where there's a lot of fire ants that are kind of attached to each other, and this is probably there's probably very little motion that individual fire ants can do because they're constrained in their motion, they're attached to the neighbors, and neighbors are attached to them, and it's forming this rigid connected uh, structure. So it's difficult for them to adjust the position of the overall shape by just moving their individual motors. Um, I wouldn't say one is better than the other. One advantage of the way that we implement fire ant is it allows it to move on its own. So it's something that can be moved as a single entity uh, and join the structure uh, and like kind of crawl across the structure. And that's inspired by ants as well. Uh, if you're requiring reconfiguration to move your position of the individual modules, then sometimes uh, you can't have modules uh, move on their own and they're if they get disconnected from the structure they get lost all right thank you okay any questions from the audience uh, hi professor hi hi yeah <laughs> thanks for your wonderful talk uh uh, actually, actually, I'm curious uh, if the conduct plastic uh, will be used uh, less and less every time it uh, melts, or so well, it, yeah, or if its shape becomes. So you're wondering if like it gets damaged over time and becomes less effective. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what. I mean. uh, yeah. So go back a few slides here. Um, it does. Sorry, go back a few slides. Um, you can see that they do leave marks on the surface when they're detaching from the surface. Um, but uh, we've also found that these, these modules can actually attach to each other multiple, like 50 times at the same point before there's enough damage on the surface where it's not possible to attach anymore. Um, so we're relatively confident that these docks will last a long time. And if we need to uh, repair them, we can easily replace the docks. They're kind of modular, they pop off the robot, or we can just smooth them down again with a, uh, a soldering iron. Okay, thank you, Chris. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what I want to know. Thank you. All right, another question comes from the chat box. Uh, what kind of practical applications we can use? Uh, uh, maybe he is asking, uh, what's the particular application of Fire Ant 3D? So, I mean, Fire Ant 3D is a research platform to try to understand how do you control modular robots that are operating outside of a, a, a rigid lattice. Uh, so this is a, a platform that we're using to understand the algorithms behind it. Um, eventually, you can think of this type of system, maybe, uh, you know, they can be used for search and rescue, like they can uh, use this, this uh, ability to sense forces on the structure to reinforce structures in order to uh, prevent them from collapsing or build uh, bridges automatically. Uh, obviously that's not something that's possible with this exact hardware, this is more of a, a demonstration of the capability and not necessarily uh, something that we're planning on fielding in uh, immediately. All right, thank you. 
any potential application in the future by this kind of uh, robotic system? I mean, I, I think that the, the interesting thing that we showed with the system is that uh, by like originally when you're making lattice structured uh, robots that are lattices, uh, those are done because it's make it makes attachment very easy, right? So uh, a lattice allows you to have precise attachment. Um, but by avoiding that, uh, uh, avoiding the robots attaching in lattices, we actually were able to make a very simple robot. Uh, this robot is most of the chassis is 3D printed, and uh, the control algorithm is incredibly simple. This is a robot that's able to autonomously move around with just a current sensor and an IMU. Uh, so uh, this is just uh, to look at this concept of having uh, robots that are modular robots, but also uh, don't really care precisely about how they attach to each other. All right, thank you. All right, here comes to another question. Uh, could you share any other continuous strong connection methods? Uh, maybe uh, sure. any, any approach to make a strong connection? Yeah. So there are some other approaches. So one thing I thought was, one approach I think is really interesting. So uh, obviously anything that has mechanical hooks is a relatively strong attachment mechanism. Uh, the problem is that they're relatively complicated, expensive to make, and uh, often heavy. Um, but one uh, modular robot out of Hod Lipson's lab, which was really interesting, uses solder to actually uh, attach the robots together. So these little squares you see right here are all covered with uh, uh, some low melt solder. And whenever the robots attach, whenever the robots come in contact with each other, they pass current through that and melt, or they pass current through resistors behind it and melt that solder to kind of weld the robots together. Uh, so that's another example of these strong attachments. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, one thing that you have to consider is not only you have to make strong attachments, but they have to be something that's easy to disconnect as well. So uh, like gluing robots together makes really strong attachments, but it's really hard to disconnect that glue. So you have to have something that's uh, both strong as well as something that's very easy to remove. Okay. Uh, other questions? Uh, hi, Mike, uh, Professor Michael. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, and I wonder, uh, I have a question related to the uh, uh, to the bridge that you make with this kind of robot. Um, Sorry, the, the bridge? Okay. Uh, we, we have a perpendicular force, and uh, uh, I mean, how much can uh, it affect the connection of the robot? Because uh, it's a very small connection, and then also uh, the force, it's uh, to the, uh, uh, it's, it's more like a, a parallel to the ground. So I wonder, like, when you stand on the bridge, um, maybe it can break or something like that. Right. Yeah, so the forces that the robots were reacting to were only forces due to the weight of other modules that they're attached to, right? Other modules in the structure. And it's not necessarily building a bridge that is designed for something heavy to walk on afterwards. Uh, so that's one area of active research, which is how do you get the robots to form these structures, but also reconfigure the structures to react to how the loads are being placed on the system. Uh, in terms of the strength of individual connections, um, by having a large surface area where the, where the spheres attached to each other, the larger that surface area is, the stronger those connectors are going to be. Okay. Uh, thanks for the answer. Yeah. Any supply, any insights on the power supply? Uh, so the um, original Fire Ant had these, uh, sorry, these. Uh, metal contacts, which allowed them to be powered externally, which was nice. Uh, the disadvantage of this is that it didn't work outside of the 2D plane. With FireAnt 3D, we actually had, uh, uh, there's batteries built into each one of these spheres, and we're able to do, I believe, about 50 attachment detachment cycles before those batteries run out, um, which is relatively, which is a relatively large number uh, you know, if you can consider other modular robots, having the ability to attach and detach 50 times before you run out of power is uh, is not insignificant. Um, it's relatively slow, but we can always set the robot into a low power sleep mode while it's waiting for the docks to cool. Uh, and all we really care about is the amount of power it takes per attachment de detachment cycle.
Um, some ways to improve the power efficiency of these robots is to uh, improve the uh, plastic that they're made of. Uh, this is just a simple conductive plastic you can buy online right now. Uh, it's used for 3D printers. Um, but you can modify the properties of this plastic to further reduce the amount of energy it takes to melt it and, and attach them. So that's another area of research we could look at. Okay. Next questions. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, but for the energy uh, uh, the question, I have another question. Is it able to make uh, the fry SPD have a energy sharing capability? Because uh, as I know, many modular robots, they may uh, they may have the ability to share their energy such that uh, they right. can be more sustainable. Yeah. Yeah. Um... And so all the batteries are contained into the robot, and anytime they are in contact with the robot, other, with the neighboring robot, is through this high-resistance conductive plastic. Mm -hmm. So if you're somehow to share energy between the robots, it, I assume most of the energy would be lost in the resistivity of the contact between the two robots. Um, I think having the system actually share energy just adds another comp level of complication to building that robot design, and that would probably make a large effect on the design of the robot. Obviously, having the system share energy would uh, increase the lifetime of the, of the overall structure as it's being formed and allow robots to move longer. Uh, but the trade-off is that just mechanically and electrically, it's a lot harder to get a robot to do that. Yeah. All right, uh, maybe we can take the, the last question because uh, the time is almost up. Is there any questions? Hello, Professor. Hi. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, so thank, you, thank you for a nice talk. Uh, I'm the first author of, of the free box paper, and, and I appreciate your attention to our work. Uh, I would like to add one point. It is true that Vivo has uh, only one active connection point. Uh, one robot only has one magnet, uh, but it can be passively connected to more than one. Uh, other 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 robot can actively to connect to this robot. So so uh, the description that Freebot can only connect to one robot may, maybe not accurate. Uh, uh, also, I said we, one magnet per robot. Yes, one magnet for one robot. So but uh, but it can be passively connected to more than one. Right. So 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 yeah. this description may maybe not so accurate. <laughs> uh, also, we acknowledge the the lack of uh, uh connection strength. Uh, is it being improved and, and has now has uh, got better performance, uh, which should be seen in the near future. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I appreciate that. I, I I put this free bot up here because I knew who I'd be talking to. Uh, but this was actually a robot that was you know we designed FireAnt two D before this robot, so you know. We weren't really comparing with this robot at the time, but I just wanted to give another example of a non-Lannist robot. Mm -hmm. uh, again, so, so thank you for your interest in our work. Uh, here, here, I have a question for you. Uh, as we all know, uh, Kilobot is one of the few multi-robot systems in the world that, that has been reported in science. Uh, as a scholar who has experience in, in public in, in this journal, the science, science robotics, and, and also working on on modular robotics, uh, modular cell reconfigure robotics, uh, can you share with us uh, what kind of work, what kind of work on on modular robots you think might fit into the scope of science or, or science robotics? Thank you. Uh, that's, a, that's a harder question. Um, I mean, those 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 publications often uh, require a very novel system, so something that. Uh, mm -hmm. looks nothing like existing systems and behaves nothing like existing systems. Uh, not something that's just, you know, making small progressive steps in a direction, but makes a huge leap, I think, is the, the, main, the main thing for those publications. Mm -hmm. All right, I think um, yeah, we can uh, get the answers. Uh, all right, uh, because the time is up. I think it's the time to end the Q&A sessions. Uh, next friend, Professor Rubenstein again for his excellent sharing. All right. And thank I, you. Yeah, yeah, and I believe our audience have learned a lot from you. Okay. Uh, thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay.
so uh, let's take a five minutes break. And after the break, I will be the next speaker to talk about our recent research. Okay, see you soon. Okay, uh, welcome back to the second leg of today's uh, air on the in the air uh, event. Uh, so we just finished our uh, first speaker uh, with Professor Michael Robinson. Uh, for our second speaker will be uh, our executive chair for this uh, activity, Professor Lam Tin Lun, Lin So just a brief. Uh, like self-introduction about myself. My name is uh, Sun Zheng Long, so I'm an uh, uh, assistant professor in uh, CHK Shenzhen. Uh, so uh, I have the honor to host for this talk. And uh, uh, before we start, let me give a uh, short introduction to uh, Professor Lam. Um, so Professor Lam is a senior member of IEEE. He currently serving as assistant professor in uh, CHK Shenzhen and also uh, executive uh, deputy director of the uh, National Local Joint Engineering Lab of Robotics and uh, Intelligent Manufacturing in the university. Uh, meanwhile, he's also appointed as the director of the Center for Intelligent Robots uh, at AIRS. Uh, so he received his uh, bachelor and a PhD degree from CHK uh, under, uh, under the supervision of Professor uh, Xu Yangsheng, and also uh, his research focus on multi-robot system, field robotics, human robot collaboration. He has been granted over 60 patents, published two monographs, and over 60 international journal and conference papers. And he has, uh, has been uh, also actively serving in the, in the robotics uh, and automation community. Uh, and he has been awarded like uh, IEEE uh, ASME, the Transaction Megatronics and Paper, Best Paper Award in 2020, uh, 2011, and also the IROS Best Paper Award on Robot uh, Mechanics and Design 2020. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's welcome Prof. Lam for, for the talk. Uh, Prof. Lam, over to you. Okay, thank you, Professor Sri. Yeah, I'm, today I'm going to talk about uh, the about inspired fee from reconfigurable robot. Uh, and I would like to talk about some background before we go to the detail of our work. Uh, as you can see here, the different type of robot exist in the world and each type of robot is good at doing specific tasks in a specific environment. And here's come the question. It is possible to have one robot that can replace all types of robot to handle different tasks in different environments In the movie of Transformer, the robots demonstrated that uh, they can transform from the vehicle to a humanoid robot and vice versa. And in reality, there is a similar approach to change the functionality of a robot. And here's an example. And you may focus on the view of the robot. Uh, the view can be transformed into a leg for maneuvering in different terrain. This transformation is achieved by the joint motion between two segments of the reels. The relationship among the linkage of the robot is keep the same. And using this method, they can usually only transform into a very limited number of configurations. And this is another example from the movie Terminator, the liquid metal robot. We can see that the transformation can be more arbitrary. It's demonstrated that it can transform into many shapes. They can even separate and merge to overcome obstacles. In reality, there is a similar technology to change the shape of liquid metal. And here's an example. The shape of the liquid metal is controlled by the electric field generated by the base. As you can see uh, here, the, the back box under the liquid metal is the base. Um, by using this technology, the shape of the robot can be uh, very flexible. However, the rest base of the robot is restricted within a certain area above the base, which makes the liquid metal unable to maneuver around the environment by itself. So we said it only have a limited rest base by this technology. All right. 
Let's look at another example from nature, the ant colony. Each ant is an individual that can navigate freely in the environment. And at the same time, the swarm of ants can come together to form a different shape to overcome obstacles. In reality, modular cell with configurable robots is one of the approaches that can achieve a similar thing. And here are some examples listed in these figures. And each module is just like an ant that is self-contained and may have certain mobility. So the rest of it is not restricted. And at the same time, they can connect together physically to form different shapes. For example, to form a slick or humanoid or a, a wheel. The number of possible configuration is determined by the number of modules. So theoretically, the configurations can be unlimited. So uh, you have the uh, features of unlimited uh, workspace and flexible configuration. And we think that the modular self reconfigurable robot is one of the promising directions to achieve a general purpose robotic system. As a modular self reconfigurable robot, it should have the following elements. And the first element is connector. It's used to connect robots physically to form a uh, configuration. And the second element is the active joint. It generates relative motion between two connected robots. And the third element is the mobile system that enable individual and group mobility. Each module should have at least two of these elements, including connectors. And typically, each element is achieved by an independent mechanism. So what's about ants? How do they achieve these three elements? Obviously, the mobile system of an ant is next and cross. And for the connector, ants also make a physical connection with other ants with their next and cross. And for, active, for the active joint, next and cross again. They form a shape and generate relative motion by climbing on their labors. We can see that the climbing approach applies one mechanism to achieve three basic elements. When we compare this bio-inspired climbing approach with the typical fixed point connector approach of the uh, traditional modular self configurable robot, and we find out that uh, there are several advantages of using climbing approach. The first one is the unified mechanism. It has the potential to reduce the mechanical complexity of the robot and also reduce the body weight. And the second advantage is that it can reach anywhere on their labors in continuous space. It results in more flexible configurations and motion can be achieved. But the challenge is, how do we realize the climbing approach on a modular self configurable robot? The list and cross approach seems to be complicated. Is there any smarter way to achieve it? Our in, uh, design inspirations come from buckyball, as you can see in this picture. A buckyball is a group of magnetic sphere. They attach together by magnetic force and we can manually manipulate them into different shapes, as you can see in this image. And the question is, can we apply this characteristic to make a modular self-configurable robot? The first challenge is how can we make this magnetic ball able to move by themselves? And the second challenge is that the buckyball is purely a mallet, as you can see uh, in here. Uh, the polar characteristic restricts the freeform connection as two balls may repulse in some orientation. By following the uh, inspiration, we finally develop Feebot. As you can see here, uh, Feebot is mainly composed of two parts, a sp uh, spherical field magnetic shield and an internal defensive drive chassis with an embedded magnet. As you can see in this figure, the magnet only occupy a very small portion 
of the pneumatic shield, it makes fiber able to connect it to almost any location on other fiber surface without magnetic repulsion. And the local motion or the climbing motion of fiber is achieved by moving the internal magnet or, or the center of gravity using the internal chassis. And this figure illustrates the connection and separation mechanism. The connection is instant and fault tolerant because uh, we use the uh, magnetic force to uh, attach on the, the other robots. And it is notable that the, in this design, all the functions are actuated by two motors only, including the attachment, detachment, the climbing, and all the actions are uh, achieved by two motors on the chassis. It makes the mechanical design of free bots very simple and which uh, greatly demonstrated that the merits of the unified mechanism by using the climbing approach. And here is the features as you list here. It can freely connect at any point to, to other robots and instant and fault tolerance connection and only have two actuators, which and the uh, uh, structure is very simple. Let's look at the uh, demonstration of this robotic system. As you can see, uh, a single free bar can walk on the ground or climbing on frail medical object, including slope or wall. And a free bar is also treated as a frail magnetic object. So a free bar can climb on another free bar, as you can see in this video. And it can be uh, easy to detach and attach. When uh, this robot faces some obstacle, they can cooperate together to overcome the obstacle. And you can see that this appearance is just like a buckyball, but it is a larger version of a buckyball, and you can easily to uh, connect it together. Although FreeBots demonstrate the excellent mobility and uh, the connection and detection uh, capability, we found out that this design, in this design, it is quite difficult to install uh, optical sensors such as camera or LiDAR uh, because the shield of FreeBot will uh, block all the lights. And during a hole in the shield to install an optical sensor is also not feasible because uh, the FreeBot is moving in a rolling motion. So the hole will roll with the shield. So, uh, so uh, the obstacle sensor is uh, difficult to install in uh, this uh, structure. So it is possible to keep the shield not rolling when the mobile booth. And we look at snail in nature and inspired by snail. Uh, the shield of snail uh, will not roll when moving. And on the other hand, the big foot of a snail can climb on other snail shield. And inspired by the snail, we designed a snail bot. So in this uh, image, snail bot is mainly composed of two parts, a spherical field magnetic shield and a walkie bogey uh, chassis with embedded magnets, which mimic the foot of a snail and in this figure shows the details of the internal design. The design is uh, complicated, it's more complicated than FreeBot, but the core merit is that it is much more easy to apply optical sensor because uh, the shield will not roll when moving. It also provides a larger connection area, which makes the connection to another robot more stable. Although the design is complicated, uh, we still only use three actuators to drive the robot. And the features uh, listed here is can provide a larger connection area and uh, it only uh, actuated by three motors. And here see the view action of the snail bot. As you can see, the snail bot can climb up from another snail bot from the ground. Uh, just very similar to snail bot, to, to, to snail. And it can also climb from one snail bot to another snail bot vertically. And we also demonstrate some uh, interesting application to make the uh, a group of snail bot to be a manipulator to manipulate things. And in this example, 
uh, we are trying to overcome a much more higher obstacle. And we can see that the snailbot can also come up uh, to snailbot and overcome the obstacle. Okay, and you finally go up to the to the boss. All right, now we have free bot and slail bot. Although they adopt different locomotion mechanism, one is rolling, we call it a rolling sphere, and other one, the snail bot, we call it a sliding sphere. Um, but they also share the same coordination topology. As this robot only has one mechanism to connect with others, uh, they can only connect in three topology. And uh, they also cannot form a parallel uh, mechanism or a more robust topology such as truss. So can we further modify our design to make the formation of uh, more robust? And here comes to the concept of modification. Uh, here you can see there are two snail balls. Uh, the first thing we do is to divided the free, uh, the snail bot into two parts, the upper part and lower part. And then we organize them to be a two new module. The strut, the strut module and the load module. As you can see, the strut module has two connecting mechanism. And with these two kinds of module, we can connect them to a more robust topology as so in this figure. And according to the modification, uh, the concept of the modification, we have developed a stru node structured uh, modular self configurable robot and we call it Friesen. Friesen contains two types of module as introduced uh, just before, the strut node and the node uh, the strut module and node module. A node module is only a spherical ma uh, field magnetic shield. And for the strut module, it includes two magnetic free form connectors with a lifting mechanism. <clears throat> the strut node structure brings good structural stability and it also enable parallel motion to increase the output force. And similar to the snail bot, the strut module can attach and work on locked module but the module transition action is different. In FISON, the transition of the strut module from one load module to another load module needs to be assisted by other strut uh, modules. And <clears throat> we can take a look of the uh, action of the FISON and the FISON system. And here is the FISON system. And actually they can compose of one load module with uh, multiple uh, strut module. And then they can uh, work by itself and connect it together. And then it gradually can um, combine together and form a robust structure. As you can see here, it is a uh, strut mechanism. Uh, it is a strut structure. And when it, this structure is formed, it is very robust. Another example is that we can actually use a series of uh, motion, including reconfigura reconfiguration, to make the uh, fission system crossing the gap. As you can see here, there are, uh, the the first part is already attached uh, another another platform. And then for the uh, for others module is gradually going to another side with the assistant with other strut modules. The strut and uh, node module from left hand side is gradually moving, shifting to the right hand side. Okay, and let me go much faster. Okay, so. Uh, because the FISON benefits from the parallel uh, connection structure, it can provide a larger force. force. Uh, here is an example. It can make a parallel mechanism and to lift up the, the weight 
and then move around. And we can also uh, make several robots and cooperate them together. As you can see here, we have a parallel mechanism on the left. And at the bottom, we have a, another parallel mechanism to push the boss to the right-hand side. All right. Till now, we have introduced our three types of modular therapy configurable robot. They are FreeBot, SnailBot, and Feasant. And we call them freeform robots because they all can climb on other robots freely. And actually, they also share the same climbing principle, which is uh, using the magnetic force for climbing and share the same climbing terrain, which is the field magnetic sphere. Because of that, they are actually mutually compatible. For example, Freebot or Snailbot can replace the node module of the Fison system to add more mobility to the entire system. Or in the swarm of Freebots, as we mentioned before, it's difficult to install any uh, optical sensor in the Freebot system. So uh, we can replace some of the Freebots with Snailbot, which can have a optical sensor installed to enable the environment perception capability of the entire uh, swarm system. Okay. And when we talk about the sensing, uh, one of the important sensing capability is uh, how do this robot capable to uh, detect the collection relationship among their labels? Because this is very important for the reconfiguration, uh, to make the reconfiguration automatically. It is relatively easy to achieve when using the fixed point connector, as the connector's location is determined and a simple contact sensor can be applied to detect if the connector is occupied. But it is not the case for freeform robots because it does not have a fixed point connector and the connection can be happened in any location on the robot surface. And, and, and since the freeform robots use the magnetic force for connection, naturally we can detect the location of the connection by using the magnetic sensor. And this figure shows that uh, we install a magnetic sensor array inside the shield and apply a graph convolution network, a localization algorithm to uh, funnel the uh, contact point. Then this video is the performance of this method. And you can see the red uh, here, the, the, the red ball is the static and for the blue, other blue balls, they are moving on the red ball and we can uh, detect the connection position instantly and reflect on, on the screen. It can be uh, detected in real time. Okay. Another aspect that is easy to achieve the by fixed point connector, but challenging in free form robots is the energy sharing among modules, because there is no socket for direct power transmission between two uh, free bus or free form robots. To achieve the power transmission among free bus, uh, we use two side of shield as the conductor with internal brush and a bridging circuit for connecting to correcting the polar connection automatically. And rely on the multiple contacts among uh, the labels of the three boss to create a closed loop circuit for energy sharing. As you can see here, it is a little bit tricky method and it is, uh, we can make uh, a bunch of three boss to form a closed circuit that's, uh, and then uh, the pressure inside can be uh, share the energy to make a uh, energy balancing. Mm -hmm. 
All right, let's talk about the local motion of modular self-configurable robots. And here is the typical approach. The first step is to form a fixed connection relationship to mimetic the, uh, the appearance of an animal or the skeleton of the animal, the skeleton of the animal, such as a uh, snake, a quadruped, or a head support, and then uh, generate the gauge pattern of the whole body by joint relative motion uh, to mimetic the motion of the animals, which is the typical approach. So what about ant pony? We can see that it does not apply the same approach as a typical modular safety configurable robot. The connection relationship is constantly changing when the ant pony is moving. And we call it <clears throat> the flow local motion. <clears throat> the local motion are shifted by a series of uh, reconfiguration. And <clears throat> actually, there exist some words on flow local motion planning, but they all assume that the size of obstacle units is the same as the modular robot, which is not applicable in a natural environment. And the gravity stability is not considered. <clears throat> in our solution, <clears throat> it is divided in two parts. The first part is the configuration planning. We applied a once inspired design to enhance the global stability of the structure and adapted to the terrain. And here you can see uh, we inspired by the uh, once we have a tangent. Uh, extended uh, on both sides, such as to support the entire uh, uh, structure of the robot to overcome the obstacle. And in the motion planning, each module will move within the supported protocol as you uh, list in this figure, such as to, uh, uh, to ensure the uh, stability of the entire system. And we can actually see that uh, view action by using this method. And in this uh, video, you can see in the orange, the orange is the planned uh, configuration. And then the right robot is the uh, robot in the uh, current location. And then uh, this uh, uh, robot need to uh, form the structure to form the uh, com uh, configuration as this in the orange position. So uh, what they do is to coming up one by one. And the individual motion of the robot is within the supporting protocol of the entire uh, configuration. And after the target configuration is formed, and then you will have another target of uh, uh, configuration. And then it's continuous to move to form the list configuration. After the list configuration is formed and you will uh, print another new configuration such that it gradually can overcome the obstacle to walk, to climb from one side to another side. And here's also another example of uh, stair climbing. As you can see, there are just like there are some arms extend in uh, both sides, just uh, in mimetic the vents, the tangent to give a support to the entire structure. To avoid the, uh, to avoid the entire uh, system will uh, fall. Okay, and you can see that uh, it is actually uh, very, uh, adapt to the environment very well because it is in a, in a spherical shape, it can uh, easily to adapt to the environment, uh, not like the block, block uh, shape, which has the problem of alignment when at, uh, attaching. The spherical uh, surface do not have any uh, alignment problem. All right. So uh, in the long term goal, what we are going to achieve is uh, just like in this video, 
as you can see, there are a lot of uh, free free form robots walking around, and they can work individually. But when facing some obstacle or difficulties, they can work together to overcome obstacle. They can uh, make connection physically to make some support, and then climb up to the location they want to go. When the role was brought by obstacle, uh, they may also able to co collaborate uh, together to move to remove the obstacle. And they can also become a bridge to crossing the gap. And our target is not only for local motion. We also want the robot can uh, do some uh, transportation tasks. For example, we can make a quadruped with the deformed robot and then uh, carry some uh, goods, carry some, uh, some object and move around. And another uh, advantage of using modular robots is that uh, it can be replaceable to enhance the, uh, the entire system uh, stability. Uh, except the uh, transport, transportation of an object, uh, the robot may also able to make some structure to support another task. Okay, of course, this is a, uh, a long-term goal for us. And to achieve this, not only we need to uh, tackle the physical problem, the mechanical design, we need to have a very robust design for attach and detach. And actually we also need to have a, um, need to let the robots know uh, where they are by themselves, such that they can uh, make a self reconfiguration and how do robots achieve the environmental perception is also a important uh, aspect for a uh, autonomous robot. And the third uh, and the fourth one is that how uh, how do robots coordinate to perform a task? Um, in previous slide, we just uh, demonstrated uh, how can they cooperate to overcome some obstacle, but uh, we. We, we want to do more. For example, uh, we, are, we want this robot can also uh, do the transportation or to form a shape to build a structure to support other, other tasks. So there are lots of things uh, we need to do uh, to, to uh, in, planning, uh, in, in planning. And uh, let me introduce our, our group. We, are at, uh, we call the Freeform Robotics Research Group. And our research focus is uh, on the multi-robot system. Uh, the topic we have just introduced is the uh, modular self-reconfigurable robot, robot, as you can see on the top layer. And actually uh, there are lots of uh, application or uh, different type of uh, multi-robot system. And the modular self-reconfigurable robot is only one kind of it. And we also are working on a, a collaborative robot and multi-robots uh, in or and the typical multi-robot system. And among them, we are studying the fundamental technology for the multi-robot system, which includes the multi-robot communication and relative localization, and multi-robot environmental perception, and multi-robot de decision-making and planning. Uh, those fundamental technology can be applied on different type of uh, multi-robot system. And uh, I would like to stop my presentation uh, here. And uh, I would like to acknowledge our colleagues. Uh, in, as you can see in this picture, they are uh, from the Freeform Robotics Research Group. And the previous work cannot be uh, achieved without them. And uh, 
if you want to uh, learn more about us, uh, you are welcome to visit our website, thefreeformrobotics.org. All right, uh, thank you very much. All right, thanks. Thanks very much for Prof. Lam's wonderful talk. Um, maybe let's see. So now we have a Q&A session. So we open to the floor uh, for the audience. See if you have any questions, you can feel free to ask the question. Uh, so maybe I can start with the question, like the question I, I asked uh, Michael just now. Um, so in terms of, uh, I mean, this is a wonderful uh, vision for a modular robot. But in terms of uh, um, energy, I, I so I still like want to ask this question. So is there any uh, vision from Prof. Lam uh, to share about the, the, the energy that we can support to, to each of these modules? Uh, the energy problem is a, a great problem for uh, modular robots because for each module, they can only carry a limited uh, battery. Uh, so uh, for each module, the battery is not very, very large. And uh, however, if we combine uh, a lot of modular robots together, they can have a very high uh, energy capacity. The problem is that how can they manage the energy among uh, this robot. This is a challenging problem. So uh, this problem is just like uh, the uh, the electric vehicles. The electric vehicle, uh, the battery pack is also contained of uh, a lot of uh, single cell battery. Yeah. Right. The, the problem is how can we manage them to uh, to make the energy level of, of each cell uh, as balanced as possible. And it is it will be a challenging topic in modular robot. Yeah, because uh, especially in the fee form uh, robot, because there are no uh, direct connection between the battery. So uh, in our previous work, we uh, make some attempts. Uh, let me go back to the previous slides. We have a work uh, talking about uh, how can we do a energy sharing among the free bots, yeah. as you can see here. Yeah, but um, although we uh, make some progress, we think that we still uh, it is not a very uh, effective approach to uh, for energy sharing. So uh, we are still looking for other uh, better methods. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another question that I, I, I always have for modular wise, I, um, we, we, we do see like now we, we have, uh, I mean, in the past, people are doing like centralized kind of control, right? When people are starting the uh, swarm, um, then indeed there will be like some communication. Uh, I, I do see that uh, you have uh, demonstrated that uh, the sensing, the perception, uh, uh, very, very uh, good control, uh, the sensing, so that can one robot can know uh, some robot is like nearby and uh, they can attach to each other. Uh, but in the in the long run, I mean, definitely this is not a, a like a question that we need to have an answer right now. But in the long run, uh, how can a, like a modular robot exactly having a big picture, like how many of its peers nearby, you see, like so that they can call them together, like the ants, right? They, they're they calling them to come together for one specific task. How, 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 uh, I don't know, Prof. Lam, do you have any vision about how to, uh, uh, how to have this kind of centralized uh, kind of, uh, or like say the, the each of them, of them they, they they can have a better sensation of the of the environment. Yes, this is a very good question, and it is also a very it is a open challenge for um, mm -hmm. modular robots. Uh, it depends on the application. If your uh, modular robot is not have very large amount, maybe some centralized control can be achieved. 
uh, mm -hmm. it is quite uh, easy to achieve it if uh, there are not very large amount of modular robots. But however, if we are talking about thousands of or, or, or 10,000 modular robots uh, working at the same time, uh, it is quite hard to use a centralized approach to do mm -hmm. all the things. Yes, uh, instead maybe uh, we can try, uh, but for the, if we make the control in a, a very flat, very distributed manner, uh, maybe the things they can do is also limited because when we do a very, uh, 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 if the robot can only uh, uh, sense the, their labels, but uh, not cannot get more information, uh, maybe uh, as much as they may be only do some simple tasks. For example, uh, maybe some locomotion, just like a swarm of, of, of birds or any, not just like a, a fish, they can uh, move from one place to another place, but they can not do some uh, thing which had a uh, more difficult. For example, they may not able to uh, make a higher level decision to, to, to tackle some more complex task. Mm -hmm. um, one aspect maybe we can uh, uh, adopt some hierarchy uh, decision planning method such that uh, we can form a small group uh, locally and then we can also uh, have a uh, top level decision maker to do some high level decision and we command the, uh, each cluster to, to perform some task. And it is my, my view okay. for, for how to solve this problem. Sure. Thanks, thanks for, fun for the uh, great insight. So there's a question from the audience. So uh, mimicking buckyball, the modular robot, uh, uh, does it have any surprising, su surprising application? Okay, maybe uh, he or she want to ask is, uh, mm. uh, is there any difference when when we make a uh, free bot rather than uh, a typical modular robot? Yeah, yeah. if it is the question, um, uh, why we need to make a uh, free form robot? And a free bot is only one kind of uh, free form robot because we discovered that uh, in the traditional uh, mm, module robot, uh, they can only connect in a fixed connector. And the connecting point is very few, maybe only one or two or not uh, at most six phase of the connection. Uh, so it will highly restrict the motion of the uh, entire module robot. And also it will make the uh, docking very complicated because you need to uh, uh, align the docking very uh, very well. Uh, otherwise, you cannot uh, make a connection. So uh, this is why we want to uh, make a fee for mobile. We want to make the robot that can uh, connect yeah. very easily. Just uh, can make an instant connection, and then uh, after the connection, the motion is also have least uh, restriction as possible, and such that uh, we make the robot can. Uh, we we call that the climbing motion, the climbing approach that uh, one uh, robot can climb in on other robot and walk continue in, in continuous space, such that uh, we hopefully we can make the free form robot have a higher capability to uh, form a uh, more ship and can uh, do more things. Yes, it is my, our, our, our goal for making a free form robot. All right. All right. Uh, I think it's, uh, if there are no other questions, I think it's almost about the time. Uh, thanks again for Prof. Lam for your wonderful talk. I, I believe that the Freeform Robot have a great future. Uh, as uh, I believe your team will be continue to uh, come out with uh, uh, great demos and uh, to finish more complicated tasks in, in the, the future. We're looking forward to it. Uh, so let's give thanks to uh, Prof. Lam again. Uh, then before we, we finish today's uh, event, let me just uh, 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 to share with you that uh, uh, thank you for participating in, in the Airs in the Air activity. So you can scan the QR code uh, and add our WeChat official account of the 
airs so for more information and uh don't forget that uh for next tuesday uh 24th of may uh 3 p.m then we have our next uh, uh stage of our event we still have two more uh, great speakers uh, for on this topic so uh welcome to join us next week so thank you prof Lam, for today's uh talk thank you for so that's that's uh that's all for today thank you for coming